man. There we go. So let's get started. And uh, today's topic uh, is customer segmentation and uh, clustering. So we're going to talk um, a little bit about the business side of the things, and then we'll switch to uh, you know, data science to algorithms. All right, so what's customer segmentation? Well, you know, in general, it's a, it's, it's a very old marketing technique um, that has to do with dividing uh, customer base or customers into a group of individuals that are somehow, you know, those groups have properties relevant to marketing and people within the groups have, you know, similar properties. And sort of traditionally, um, in uh, consumer goods, for example, the segmentation was happening along several dimensions, standard dimensions. One is, you know, geographic. So this is literally customer locations. And if you have like a global company, you know, whether it's a country or part of a country, or if it's a city, you know, it can be also local locations. Second, very, very standard uh, type of segmentation is demographic segmentation. Now, if that information is available, uh, you know, people would normally, you know, segment by gender, by age, um, sometimes occupation, if that is known. The next segment, which is, you know, very powerful is behavioral, which is, you know, the way customer behaves and the way customers interact with the service, literally, um, they're purchasing um, patterns and the way, you know, their interest pattern. And, you know, sometimes there's some sort of psychographic or, you know, personality lifestyle kind of attitude um, dimension. Now, if you notice, these are quite hard-coded dimensions. And within those dimensions, you can split people, you know, the way you want, right? Literally, you put the boundaries where you feel they should be. You can say, okay, um, I'll take a category from, you know, 20 to to 25 year old then 25 year old to 40 and then 40 to 60 and then 60 plus or i can you know split it in any other way um, based on your sort of intuition and industry experience and that's sort of that's how the customer segmentation has been traditionally done now why would you want to do this whatsoever why would you want to put those boundaries well there are several you know reasons why why industry is doing it well, first of all, it's, you know, the, for, the, for the purpose of marketing. Because you do want, uh, you know, to reach to the customers and you do want to convince them, uh, you know, to use your brand or to use your service. And different customers have different interests, different values, different tastes, different reasons why they come to the store and purchase things. And so one single message does not work too well for everybody. And so the idea is to target a message to the segment. Now, you cannot make a bazillion messages, um, but one message is also bad. So what you do is you split customers into some sort of, into the segments where you believe they can, for example, be somewhat similar, right, based on the dimensions we just discussed, and then target a particular marketing message to the interest you believe they have. Now, you also want to be able to identify, you know, the most and the least profitable customers. So for example, the use of the service, you know, most profitable, you might actually, you know, give them some bonuses. Um, it's a loyalty program, right? Least profitable, well, it depends on whether if they're just customers, that's fine. You might want to kind of try to promote them, right? Convince them to buy more. Or, you know, if it's a service, you know, sometimes you might want to get rid of them. Um, Based on this sort of marketing segmentation, you also want to build loyal relationship with certain type of customers, like if you believe that that your base. Uh, finally, there is this very interesting topic um, of creating, you know, personas. Uh, persona, it's sort of representative customer, right? So you kind of, um, you know, build an you know, average representative customer and then try to sort of understand how this representative persona, this customer would behave in certain circumstances, how it would react to um, certain offers, to some offers. Now, the, again, the, the, the point is that usually your customer base is, you know, varies a lot. 
And so, you know, creating, um, you know, one sort of representative customer for the entire customer base is, is usually useless. Um, and you would rather, you would rather partition it, split it into smaller parts, right? Um, to actually where, where, you know, the population, your customers are a little bit more homogeneous in, you know, again, we're talking about those dimensions, whether it's going to be sort of age, gender, location, income. Okay, so that's, first of all, it's for marketing. Second, um, you know, depending of the segments you see, uh, you might want to, if you're a store, carry different brands, right? Let's say if it is, you know, you, you, you realize it's, you know, mostly customers are young customers, maybe, you know, you go for H&M and if you um, if, if, if they're expensive, if you realize, you know, you're, you're in a, in a rich neighborhood, um, you and then, you know, maybe Gucci is the right, um, option, right? You can also customize products and services and provide different services for different, um, segments. And that's, you know, taken to absolute extreme, you know, in travel industry, um, where you have, you know, different classes of services, um, you know, and, and for example, you know, there are obvious classes of services like sort of business versus economy versus whatever now it's called economy plus. Um, but then there is sort of implicit things that airlines internally try to, to dis differentiate, for example, business travelers versus leisure travelers, because that's, you know, depending on what type of traveler um, you are, um, you might have or not have um, sort of headroom in terms of, you know, buying additional services, right? Um, and of course, you, you know, you want to predict future purchasing patterns from different categories. So then you can actually um, adjust your supply chain. Finally, you can price products differently. You can actually offer the same product um, to different customers depending on the segment. And it is well known that, for example, Expedia and some other travel sites um, check and offer different pricing depending on even what notebook you use when you log in into their site. It's, it's known that for like Apple users, the prices will be a little bit higher. So, uh, because they believe that, you know, if you're, if you're a Mac or Apple user, uh, your income is higher. And so, you know, you're not, you're less sensitive to prices. Again, the same thing with, with airlines, right? Um, the reason they don't want to mix up tra um, business and, and leisure travelers is because um, they don't want to sell the same product to those people who can pay more for it right, for the same price, but at the same time, um, they don't want to cut out uh, the people who don't have enough money and they, they cannot pay for higher, uh, more expensive products. So then, you know, you split your, your plane into uh, classes and, you know, try to adjust the price for each um, segment. So the willingness to pay is also a big deal. All right, so these are like sort of the reasons why you don't want to deal, maybe sometimes they're obvious, um, sometimes not, but this is why you don't want to sort of deal with the customers as a, as a sort of one common crowd and you would like to partition it. Um, and uh, as we just discussed, you can partition customers into groups based on a sort of very simple criteria like age, location, income, etc. Then the question there is sort of where to put those boundaries, right? Um, and that's not an easy question. Now, very often in marketing, um, we do what's so-called, you know, RFM approach or are using RFM metrics. Now, this is, this stands for uh, recency, frequency, and I don't know why it's monetary. It's just the, the total revenue you get from a customer. So the idea is um, that you want to see um, you know, there, these are the important factors for a store, for example, right? Um, you know, the, the, the recency is the freshness of the customer activity. So how recent the customer is, right? Um, if he's purchasing, uh, you know, if he purchased recently or if he's kind of, you know, old um, customer, um, then there is a frequency, which means, you know, how often a customer transacts and, you know, for example, at Starbucks, that's going to be like, you know, daily or several times a week. Um, and so recently when, when the customer was there last time, and then the, the revenue, the monetary, the total customer spent, um, in the store. And so, for example, these, um, are the features, these are the properties that you can 
calculate from the transactional data, right? Typically in the store, you will have transactional data where for every customer, um, you will have, I mean, for, for you know, every uh, transaction, um, if you have a loyalty card, if the customer has a loyalty card, you will have uh, his loyalty number, then you have a data transaction, you know, the sum, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so from that, you can actually create these metrics. Now, right now you should have thought instantly that this looks very much like you know, what we do, like just feature creations, right? Like you know, feature generation, feature engineering uh, for machine learning. And in fact, you know, these are very, very good features. And we'll, in the homework, we'll try to practice them. Now, when you have those features, um, and this is sort of, again, traditional marketing analysis, um, where based on those features, um, you know, marketers, they split customers into groups, right? And, you know, sometimes they put like, you know, like putting funny names, like, you know, champions, which is probably the customers that, um, you know, according to this uh, picture, it has highest, um, you know, highest recency score and highest frequency score. So they come often, um, they uh, come like, you know, they were there recently and, uh, you know, they spend a lot of money, right? Or there are customers like hibernating customers, those that, you know, don't come frequently and uh, the recency score is very low. So they were a long time ago. And then there was like promising customers, potential loyalists, customers at risk, et cetera, et cetera. So this is all done literally by hand and every store, um, you know, every company will have sort of its own marketing strategy in this type of segmentation analysis done. And the positioning of these boundaries is really done by hand, right? So the question is, can we do better than that, right? Can we actually try to identify those groups of customers that are similar in their behavior and then, you know, offer, you know, make, make offers for them? Now, what I'm trying to say is, here the boundaries are fixed and it's sort of orthogonal in some sense, right? So you, you kind of cut out a very particular, um, you know, customer on this, on, on, on this uh, two-dimensional plane. But maybe um, there is a better way of doing it. And the answer is yes, there is, uh, it's called clustering, right? So, um, what's clustering? Clustering is, um, you know, a, a way to find patterns in the data. Now we're switching uh, to more of like data science analytics story. And let's for a second look at this uh, picture. Um, let's say, you know, every point is a customer and, you know, on, on the X and Y axis is some sort of score, whatever, whatever numeric score we came up with. And so the idea would be to come up with an algorithm that allows us to detect natural groups here, right? So by looking at this slide, um, can you see if some natural groups? Yeah, and it feels like, you know, there's probably, here is there's a group, maybe this one is a group, and here is a group. Right, so it feels like this customer is based on uh, the those two axes, whatever the axes are. They are more similar to each other than to the rest, right? And then, if you want to build a marketing strategy, maybe you need to build, you know, three different strategies for those three groups of people. Moreover, if you identify those three groups, you can probably, you know, pick up centroids of this group or even create the sort of centroids of the group either pick up a customer or create the customer in there that would be the most representative customer um, and then build your strategy for that type of persona right so problem set up we want to create those clusters which are groups of points and we want to assign every point to one cluster. So we'll restrict this 
again, into assigning point to one cluster. We'll not talk about, you know, probabilities or about, you know, points being able to belong to two different clusters. We'll just focus on one cluster. Predictors or features can be both numerical or categorical. Here I'm showing two numerical axes. Um, one important point here is this is called unsupervised learning. Why is it unsupervised learning? Well, so far we talked about supervised learning, you know, cl uh, classification and uh, regression. Over there, for every point, we have a target. We had target variable, right? So for we had x's and y's, um, and uh, then we could do a prediction, right? For so for some number of x's, we had y's. For others, we didn't have y's, so we could predict those y's for those where we they, they didn't exist. Here, there is no there is no target variable. There is no y's. It's only x's, right? So it's only coordinates of the data points. And our task again is to find their groupings. All right, any questions so far? All right. So, you know, this, this question is answered by clustering algorithms. And there is, you know, as, as always, there, is, there are multiple algorithms um, out there. Um, the, the most famous are k-means and hierarchical clustering, and we're gonna talk about both of them today. Um, there is also a very good algorithm uh, widely used, it's called dbscan. Uh, db stands for uh, density-based. Um, then there is spectral clustering, and then there's sort of Gaussian model mixtures. Uh, they are also used, but they're more kind of specific algorithms. So, you know, again, workhorses um, of the, in, in the industry are k-means and here are hierarchical cluster. Now, when we do clusters, you know, if you want to put those points, group them together, you know, one thing that we need to start with is we need to understand and define um, what do we mean by similarity, right? What do we mean that the points are similar? Now, in this picture, in this picture, we kind of automatically assume that um, these are, you know, points in two-dimensional space and that we have Euclidean distance, sort of usual, typical, usual distance that we have, right? And then if we talk about similarity between points, we can say, okay, well, look, these two points are next to each other, sort of distance between them small. So, um, you know, they they have a small distance between them, right? Now, if I take these two points, the distance is large. So it's typically Euclidean distance. Now, um, we can, you know, that's sort of the, the, the standard, the fundamental way of doing it. Right, it's called Euclidean distance. Now you can also think about Manhattan distance, where instead of some of the square roots of, of the coordinates, you know, you take the sum of absolute values, which kind of represents, you know, the, the walk on Manhattan, how far you need to walk on the city which is built on a grid. You can also think about correlation distance, where uh, you know the distance is defined through the correlation. So if uh, you know you, you, you create correlation matrix and correlation functions, then you can actually convert it into a distance. Now, the challenge with in here, and that's a very important challenge and we need to be very careful with this, is that this distance assumes that all dimensions are, um, have, have the same meaning, right? While, you know, typically if I have um, if we're working with the customer data, you have attributes that have very different meaning. Let's first of all look, we have numerical attributes like age, all right? And for example, income. So here is 2340, for example, this is income. Now, the challenge with just straightforwardly using this distance is that it will add up 
it will consider both age and income similar way, which means it says, okay, if we want to define a distance in between those two customers, between person A and person B, well, okay, the income difference is, um, you know, 40,000. So we put 40,000 as a difference. And then on the other dimension, the difference is age is 17. Well, we'll just add 17. Oh, clearly 17 will disappear, uh, will not have any effect on the result um, compared to this difference of 40,000 within income, right? So you need to do something about it. Um, the way to do this is to either, you know, rescale or normalize, or maybe within the Euclidean distance, use different coefficients in front of the different um, attributes, right? So that there will be rescaling the effect of, um, you know, of, of the scale within attributes. Now, when we deal with categorical attributes, like for example, here is sex, um, you know, the, the way to deal with it is put in, you know, manhot encoding. So it's going to be, for example, if it's binary, it's zero, one, or if it's not binary, um, you know, it's, it's again, manhot encoding. Um, and, and then literally, you know, within Euclidean distance is going to be either distance zero, if, if uh, uh, the attribute coincides or, uh, or one, if it is, if it is not. So this is something you need to pay attention to, right? This doesn't come for free. In, typical, in usual, you know, it's kind of textbook uh, examples, uh, you know, you're given some coordinates and uh, clustering works great. In real life, you, most of the time you're dealing with those attributes of different types. And so you need to make sure when you, you know, use them, um, you pay attention to how you define distance. Any questions here? Okay. All right, so k-means. Now, k-means, in fact, is, um, you know, is extremely simple, and it is amazing how efficient it is and how well it works. So the idea of k-means is, is, is following. Um, you actually, in order to do the k-means clustering, you actually need to provide a number of clusters, which is a bummer because uh, you might want to, you know, to allow clustering, you might, you might hope that clustering will discover the, the structure of your data set on its own. But in fact, for k-means to work, you need to tell k-means how many clusters you want, all right? And then what happens is, is very simple. There are different ways to initialize k-mean clustering. One of them is just, let's say, um, you know, have, I, I would say, three clusters. I would use three clusters here as an example. Um, let's say, you know, we start all the data points. Um, now we're going to initialize. And what we're going to do is we'll just uh, put um, a randomly assigned um, points to, um, you know, all three clusters, right? Just split all the points in three groups and randomly assign them. And then for each group, and here each group is shown as a in, in a particular color, we calculate the centroid. And here it's like, think about like center of mass of the system, right? Uh, we calculate the centroid. And because we randomly assign colors, all these centroids are you know, very close to each other. On the next step, what we do is we go and for every point, reassign it to the centroid where it is um, going to be the nearest to. And that's what you get here. And then you keep going. And very soon, um, will the, the, the algorithm converge to this result. Um, you know, formally, what we're doing is uh, we're minimizing uh, total within cluster Euclidean distance in between um, all points and the cluster centroid, right? And then we minimize it across all the clusters. So, you know, this algorithm actually works really, really well. It works in, you know, lots of dimensions. Uh, you just need to define, um, you know, 
the distance and distance here, um, we propose uh, Euclidean distance. Now, how do you choose optimal number of clusters, right? Because as I said, um, you, know, the, you know, you need to provide it. I mean, this is a try and error approach where what you do is you start with some, so the first of all, you know, if you know the data, you know the, the domain, you have some initial idea of how many clusters you, you might have there, right? And so that's what you propose. Um, here, let's say we start with two clusters, we can do three clusters, we can do four clusters. Now, depending on how many clusters you propose, your algorithm will actually find, you know, two clusters, three clusters, four clusters. Um, as we discussed already, this is unsupervised learning, which means there is no ground truth. We don't know what's sort of the right thing here. You know, maybe the best uh, clusters here are, you know, uh, three clusters. So this is, maybe this is the best partitioning, or maybe, you know, this is the best partitioning with four. It's hard to say, right, by just eyeballing. And we have you, when you have a bigger data sets, um, of course, it's even harder. So one of the ways, and, and one of the ways to, you know, figure out what the best clustering and the optimal number of clusters is um, actually by creating um, this um, curve where on the x-axis you put number of clusters and on the y-axis you actually put this metric that we used to compute the algorithm. Um, you don't need to do it yourself. There are usually with an algorithm, there are usually, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's usually one of the outputs. And so then uh, there is this elbow method that says like, look at this curve and find um, that part on the curve where it bends, right? This sort of has an elbow and that gives you the optimal number of clusters. Okay. Um, you know, the, the reason is here is just because, uh, you know, people looking for sort of diminishing return point, right? And after that, you know, adding more clusters do not improve your clustering too much, the, the metric. And so you kind of, you know, add clusters until your, your, your metric is getting better and better. Um, and then when the returns start like getting smaller and smaller, you know, you stop. So it's not a, you know, deep mathematical science, but, you know, it's quite sort of popular method. And there are other methods um, similar to, to this one that allows you to select optimal number of clusters. But in any case, the approach is you give um, k-means the number of clusters you want, it finds you that number of clusters. Then you, it's your job to check if you're happy with that number of clusters or not, right? That's k-means. Um, oh, I didn't have, I, I thought I have a slide of k-means actually um, producing different number, different um, type of clusters. Now k-means unfortunately also has this property um, because it doesn't find you know, the unique optimal solution. It has this property that when you um, start it multiple times and start it with different clusters, it might, you know, seed clusters might find different configuration. Um, all of them will have sort of similar quality, but, um, you know, it's, if you run over and over, you might get slightly different results. Okay, so next um, algorithm is hierarchical clustering. And in fact, I think I, myself, I probably used m most of the time, you know, hierarchical clustering. Now it's expensive in terms of number of computations, but these days um, it's, you know, compute power is pretty cheap and uh, it's sometimes even better to like subsample data, right? Not to take all the customers, but, you know, build this type of clustering and um, then kind of classify the rest of the customers into the clusters. Now, so what hierarchical clustering does is in fact, it doesn't give you clusters right away. Instead, it builds you a tree that shows you how to group together points to form clusters, right? So as a result, 
of the, of the output of hierarchical clustering algorithm, you get a tree, tree-like structure. And then you need to yourself, again, to kind of cut this tree on a certain level, uh, you, will, you will see in a second what I mean, um, to, to find out the clusters. So let's just look at how algorithm works and then we'll discuss its property. Um, you know, it works in a, in a very straightforward fashion. Remember, uh, we need for all the clustering algorithm, we need you know, similarity, we need to understand how similar the customers are or what's the distance between them. So the idea of k-means is the following. You go through all the possible pairs and pick up the one that is closest. Right? Again, if, it's, if we are in two-dimensional space and this is Euclidean distance, you know, we just pick up two data points that are closest. If we're using some metric, some other metric of similarity, uh, we pick up those that are the most similar. Right? Okay, so pick up those. Then we go and search uh, you know, for, for, for next um, closest, um, you know, for, for what, what to merge next, right? Um, what we do here is we actually um, can go for the next uh, pair and it can be a pair like here, right? And we merge them. Now notice uh, while I'm doing it, notice how we construct a tree structure growing from the bottom. Here we said A and C and we merge them into one cluster. On the vertical axis, we actually, it's actually showing the distance between them. So this is the lower, this is the distance that we had here. Next to, we're gonna merge these guys. And this is the distance. We then, we then you know, keep looking at um, you know, each following point and we're trying to decide whether to merge it um, with uh, some other point. And what we can find out, for example, in here on the point D, that out of you know, all these points, it's actually closer to the center of this cluster of points E and B then to F. And so we merge it with these guys. And here is what's happening. Then we join these two clusters and then we join point F because it was the furthest away point. And you get this tree. Okay, so you have a tree, but we don't really have clusters. In order to get clusters, you need to decide on which level you cut this tree. So if we decide that we want to cut the tree on this level, and this means um, we will call clusters anything that has a distance, um, you know, the cluster will be if points have a distance less than 0.5, you know, then we literally will have only this one cluster and this every node will be its own cluster. If we decide that, look, we call clusters everything that has internal distance more than point, whatever it is, put in here, it will create for us three clusters because we cut it at this level. If we decide this height, it will create you know, two clusters. One cluster of one single point F and one cluster of all these points. So in some sense, um, we, we, we're not avoiding the problem of k-means where you have a, um, you know, where, where you, 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 you were supposed to give a number of clusters um, and, and then uh, the algorithm will compute, you know, where they are. Um, here, we build a tree, but then when, you know, you cut the tree, you actually implicitly defining the number of clusters. You know, in some way you can go in reverse and say, I want four clusters. Um, then uh, if you have this tree, um, you can determine that, um, you know, in order to have four clusters, you need, uh, you know, to cut the tree and this level, right? And that will be your clusters. But the point is, you know, you create this tree once, 
that's very expensive. It takes time. But after that, parsing and cutting this tree is very easy. That's one point. The second extremely important point with hierarchical clustering is that, you know, in, in real life, a lot of things um, do have internal this hierarchical structure, right? You know, we, we, we aggregate houses into streets, streets into, you know, regions, reg uh, yeah, I don't know, districts, districts into the cities, cities into the countries. So there is an, 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 an internal hierarchical structure. Um, the same often happens, you know, even with a group of customers. And so this allows you to actually see that hierarchical structure. And for example, you want to create marketing strategy for you know, this big cluster, and then you realize that, look, maybe there is something slightly different in the behavior. You, know, you split the strategy into you know, this cluster and that cluster, right? So it allows you to build hierarchical uh, strategies also, and um, uh, you know, depending on sort of how much, um, how much resources you have, you can either build sort of one, um, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can build one strategy, which will be, you know, which would make sense to do clustering, but you can go sort of below here is it, you know, two clusters, two different strategies, you know, or you have more sort of resources or you want to be more granular, you go into three clusters, et cetera, et cetera. So the point being here is this gives you much more flexibility and also gives, tells you, a story of how you know your your even not only the clusters but how clusters relates to each other, right? So how those because k-means will just gives you clusters. This will tell you, okay, you know what? This cluster and this cluster is also quite similar, and so if you wanted to have two clusters, you would merge them together. All right, does this make sense? Okay, good. I can, I can, sorry, I can barely hear you. Can you speak up louder, please? Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, uh, it is that uh, the Android uh, on the y-axis, there is distance, right? So yes. what, what is this distance? So it is distance between centroids of clusters or, um, or it depends on the algorithm we uh, provide for clustering, uh, which is distance between uh, closest points, like uh, between yeah. A and B, or it, or it depends, or it is uh, between centroids. Very good question. So, um, so when we're starting, right, when we're just starting, uh, these are, you know, every point is a cluster, right? Mm -hmm. And so the distance is obvious, is just the distance between those two points. Now, let's say we're already in this stage. You know, this is one cluster, this is another cluster, right? So um, there are several ways to actually define this distance, and it's called linkage. So there is a single linkage. Uh, approach, which is computing the shortest distance between points in the cluster. There's a complete linkage, which is picking up the longest distance. Then there is an average, which is obviously, you know, computing average. And then there is centroid distance, which is you take the center, center, and, you know, use this distance. You fix up the, pro you, you select one of those approaches, right? Uh, probably it's average is one of the most stable or centroid, one of the most stable. You select one of them and that would be the distance that is measured here. But when you start at the beginning, you know, doesn't matter which approach you take, this is just the distance between uh, points. Make sense? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, so a uh, couple more words about this. Um, it is sort of bottom up, right? Sort of agglomerate, it's, you know, the name for this, sometimes it's called agglomerative clustering because what we do is we agglomerate, right? We put things together. Uh, um, it is hierarchical because, you know, it builds hierarchy. There are other approaches which are also hierarchical, which is called top-down, where you actually take all the data 
points and then split into pieces and split into pieces and split into pieces and build hierarchy. Um, for example, um, spectral method does that. Um, but again, this one, you know, it's, it's computationally expensive, um, but with today's computing power and with smart sort of sampling of the data, that's probably one of the most useful algorithms out there to understand the structure of your, of your data. And again, remember why we're doing it, right? We're doing it so for each of those clusters, we can propose particular um, strategy. All right. Now, uh, just sort of for entertainment purposes, um, you know, as, as I said, with, within the supervised learning, there is this ground truth, right? And so we can actually numerically check uh, how well your prediction works, right? Whether it's regression, checking the RMSC scores, or if it is um, classification, we check confusion matrix or rock oak. In clustering, there is no ground truth. And so what, that's why, you know, when people look at the different clustering algorithms, what they do is they came up, come up with different data, with different examples, and trying to make, trying to run clustering algorithms of those examples and see how they behave and how miserably they fail. And then they compare, and you know, depending on what you expect to see in your uh, case, you select particular type of clustering. Now you might notice that, and, and there is a bunch of methods um, shown here on the top. Um, you know, we just discussed uh, pretty much. You know, uh, this this is a k-means, um, and we discussed uh, you know agglomerative clustering. These are two clusterings we discussed. Now, for whatever it you know whatever it takes, um, whatever it works, you know, both of them. I mean, pretty much every clustering can handle well. You know, this scenario, right? But some clustering have like lots of issues with uh, you know, other scenarios. Like for example, you know, some clustering can find clusters where they actually do not exist, right? And k-means, if, if you tell k-means, hey, find me three clusters, it will find you three clusters, even if they don't exist. It's just the quality of the clusters. The metric will show you that they're bad clusters, but it will find you. Um, you know, there is, when you have some overlapping situations, things can, can, can go wrong easily. Um, you, you notice that k-means, for example, will not be able to cluster correctly. Well, I mean, correctly here, I would assume that the right clustering here would be, you know, um, have one color, you know, one cluster is this circle, the other cluster is that circle. So, you know, k-means cannot handle that. Now, if it's a big problem for your data, uh, you know, unless you expect having circles in there or, or like, you know, those kind of shapes, um, you know, the, the, this moon-like, um, you know, semi-moon-like shapes, you know, you're probably okay. But that tells you that different clustering algorithms behave very different in you know, a different data sets. And so if you want like sort of ultimate performance, you know, I recommend you check a few of those. But again, you know, this one, this one, you know, DB scan um, and probably spectral, these are like sort of the most popular clusters as a clustering algorithm as of today. All right. Now, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and, and talk about yet one more unsupervised learning technique, which is extremely insanely important. Um, it is important for, as a pre-processing technique for supervised learning, for unsupervised learning, it's important for visualization, right? Um, Quite often, you know, we show you things in this two-dimensional pictures. Now, how do we get there if we have, you know, 20 features? Let's say we have 20 features and, uh, you know, we still want to draw our data points. You know, one of the ways to do this would be to do this pair plots, right? But, you know, if you have, say, 10 features and you want to do pair plots, that's going to be 10 by 10 matrix, right? So you need to do 100 of them. You have 20 features, it's 400 pair plots to actually see something. Um, and those pair plots are sort of those slices along different axes. Sometimes you will not be able even to see anything if you, if you do that. 
though I would recommend you to look at some pair plots, but you know, you clearly cannot cover all of possible pair plots. And here comes principal component analysis or PCA. So the idea is, is the following. The idea is actually very simple, very beautiful. And um, can somebody guess how old did this algorithm? From 50s or 60s? 1901. Uh, 1901? Yeah. So there's more than 100 years old. So <laughs> compared to like K-means, which is actually from 60s, right? And, and, and uh, um, I believe the uh, agglomerative clustering is from 70s. This is like one of the oldest things. In fact, um, this comes from linear algebra. So the, the reason is, you know, k-means uh, is sort of data mining, machine learning thing. Um, this is pure linear algebra. So the idea is, 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 is simple and beautiful. You know, if we have data points, and let's say they are, you know, that like, like simulated data set, like we have here on, this, on the picture, the idea is I want to find the dimension, the direction, where I have the maximum variance in the data. So variance means the data is spread along that dimension um, the most. So if it is, you know, cigar, right, the ellipsoid, well, um, sort of, oops. Um, you know, this is our data points. It's clear that the data is, you know, elongated along that dimension, right? So what I want to do is I want to detect that dimension in the data. And here I show you two-dimensional data, but of course you do it in any dimension. So you detect that dimension and there is a way to do it and actually PCA does it for you, right? Then what it does, you create this direction, this principal component axis. And then you look for the axis that is orthogonal to this one and also has in this orthogonal plane, has the largest variance. Now, if we have two dimensional data, there is sort of no option, right? Because after I created this axis, um, you know, here, my only option for, for the second axis is just orthogonal to. If we had three dimensional, I could, you know, be in the plane perpendicular to, you know, to this, to my you know, first axis and I could be at any direction, right? And so then I solve the same kind of problem of uh, finding the optimal direction. Now, why would I bother to do this, right? What's the value in here? So, but the value is the idea, the brilliant idea is the following. Um, you know, for each point here, for each point, we have two coordinates, right? have two coordinates. So any point I need to, you know, write down those two numbers. If I ignore those, you know, if I ignore one of the X's, ignore X1 or ignore X2, it's pretty much means I, I will have to draw, you know, my points, all points here. Right. Now, the idea here would be the following. Instead of using X1 and X2 to describe position of every point, so in, instead of using this X1 and X2, if I define this axis PC1, PC2, I can use these coordinates to define position of my point. I can use these coordinates to define position of my point, right? So instead of using this, I actually can use this, all right? So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is the following, that if I decide here to drop and completely ignore second coordinates, all of my points, will, you know, 
kind of collapse on this line. But they will still preserve a lot of information that existed when they were scattered around. If I ignore the x1 or x2, I would lose a lot. If I ignore right now PC2, I will lose some information, but not all. And that's the essence of, of principal component analysis. That's the essence, essence of dimensionality reduction, which is finding uh, the way to, instead of having 20 features, have you know, five features, and they have, have, still have them quite representative. So dropping those that are not important. And the way to do it is by you know, using this PCA and processing the data with PCA. Let me, um, I think on the next slide, I have a, yet another visualization of this. So here it is. Again, if I have data points and um, these are data points. This is my, the blue ones are the actual data points. And here are the coordinates of those data points, right? X1 and X2, X1 and X2. So if, I'm, if I can find, if I find this axis U1 that goes along the maximum variance, then I can replace um, those two coordinates, X1 and X2, with just one coordinate, which is I will position our, my points onto the axis. Now, how much of mistake do I make if I do this? Well, this is information that I lose. If I choose different line, and instead of the line U1, I'll say, draw this line, and instead of you know, those blue data points, I'll project them on here. Oops, that's here, this is here, this is here, this is here. That's the sum of all these pieces that are gonna lose, it's a lot. So principal component analysis guarantees you that it selects the axis such, such a way that you lose the minimum amount of information possible if you go from two dimensions to one dimension. Now, of course, it's not only two dimensions to one dimensions, and you probably have seen this type of pictures before. These are points in three dimensions, right? And they're just color coded. Um, we, using principal component analysis, we find, in this case, um, not one dimensional axis, but two dimensional plane. And then we project those points on that plane. So if you look then sort of on that plane, this is a projection that's gonna look like. So the plane is oriented along the maximum variance in the data points, right? And that's the picture you're gonna see. Now I could have projected this onto, you know, one dimension because again, the PCA goes for, um, you can reduce dimensionality to any dimension you want. I could have projected all these points, you know, along this plane, there's probably two axes and I can project them on this axis and then I'll have, we'll lose more information. But the idea is that this is the closest in this low dimensional space that you can find. So if you have, for example, um, if you have, for example, data set, you know, multiple data points, and let's say three features, you might want to run principal component analysis and you will compress this to two features. You will lose some information, but um, you will gain, well, first of all, if you do it on two dimensions, you'll get some visibility so you can do visualization. But more importantly, um, you know, if you do this, you can actually you know, simplify your computations. 
Now, going from three to two, you know, you probably wouldn't want to do it, but if you have 50 dimensions, you might be able to run principal component analysis and reduce it to much smaller dimensionality. This is especially important if you use uh, one hot encoding. And so um, you take you know, your categorical features and make them numerical vectors. Then all of a sudden, the number of columns in your data set increases dramatically, right? Because, from, because of the one column um, that is a categorical feature, you might get, say, if there are 10 categories, you'll get 10 new columns, right? And so you'll have, you'll start having a lot of uh, columns in, the, in your data, which means it's becoming higher dimensional. And so you might want to use this dimensionality reduction, which is, you know, instead of having, say, 20 columns and 20 features, you will reduce them to you know maybe five or ten. Now there is no, I mean, th there are some ways that tells you sort of the optimal number of dimensions um, you want to reduce to. It's it's sort of out of the scope for our class, but you know the the important thing is you run PCA analysis on the data when you want to visualize it, and so you want to figure out the sort of the dimensions along which the data changes a lot and um, you know, you, you reduce it to two dimensions and you look at the data points in two dimensions and you might be able to see clusters. And you also reduce dimensionality and feed this into, for example, k-means. So when you do k-means clustering on uh, raw data with, um, uh, you know, with one hot encoding, it might get lost because you really end up just having, when you compare features, you can, you, you have just binaries, zeros and ones. Um, if you do this dimensionality reduction, it might actually help k-means clustering. So the idea is you do dimensionality reduction, you send it to k-means. Okay. Now with PCA, you know, really the best thing is to try it, right? And then you will see the results, uh, how it works. And uh, probably the, the key message here um, for the PCA is um, that it's the axis along the maximum variance of the data, All right? So that's your PCA axis. And you will see how PCA is used today at the seminar. You will see how PCA is typically used um, for visualization purposes, all right? Okay, so we're gonna have a short lecture today. Um, you know, we're done. Um, any questions? Yes, I have a question. So, uh, for example, if we want to split our groups for equal, for equal groups, I mean, for example, for a B testing, I mean, not for uh, to, to cluster, I mean, for B testing. Can we do this um, using ML? Um, I would say probably, uh, you know, it, it probably does not make sense when you do, when you want to do, when you do A-B testing, you typically, uh, you know, do you know, sampling, right? You kind of want to select certain type of people um, and you don't want to do it with, you know, A-B testing with everybody. So you want to select, say, 10% of, you know, certain type or like 3% of certain type. Um, so unless you, you, you first, you know, want to do clustering and find those groups and then kind of A-B test one group against the other, um, you know, I don't see the clustering usage in there. So again, yeah. mm -hmm. I understand that, uh, standard clustering problem, it's not applicable because we have two other group. We, in A-B testing, we, uh, we want opposite. We want uh, yeah. two equal groups. So but can we and, some, and the representative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, can we some reformulate clustering problem because I think it's kind of similar for um, solve problem when we want to similar group. Uh, I mean, equal with some uh, equal number of points in the group. Yeah, similar. You you can actually you know you can actually reformulate clustering. Um, you know you can write your own clustering algorithm that one of the constraints will be. Um, 
that you know it, it tries to keep um, the similar number of data points right now quite often if you do this um, most likely it will be sort of soft constraint in the sense it will not guarantee you that it has exactly equal number of points but it can tell you like okay um, it will be very close right so it kind of algorithm will gonna punish uh, you know algorithm will gonna be punished if you get very unbalanced uh, groups but yeah you can you can you know you can form your own algorithm that forces to do it in fact um, you know at least um, sort of the, 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 the very similar topic to clustering, which is called, you know, graph partitioning, for example. And there, um, there are very well defined problems where you want to split graphs such a way that they have equal number of nodes. And that's quite similar. I mean, you can convert clustering into graph partitioning. So, um, yeah, the, 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 there are problems and people kind of worked on that for, for particular for very particular applications. Okay, but so this is not standard. I mean, you know, you don't usually do it for, for A-B testing. I mean, my question actually will not be about number of equals points. My question will be about um, equal distribution for each of that set. I mean, uh, I mean, imagine now you have uh, two clusters with uh, um, obviously different distribution. What is the main goal for ABA testing? Uh, you want uh, two groups with uh, e equal distribution. I mean, it's a uh, so, sort of uh, obvious. It's just you uh, take first class and second class and uh, pick up uh, one half uh, points in the first cl uh, cluster and uh, pick up one half, uh, half points in the second class, merge this. So it's your control uh, control group and uh, as it's your experience group. So something yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, if, if, if that's your, your goal, yes, you can definitely do that. I mean, the whole goal of clustering is to create sort of, you know, assign all the people within the group, you know, having the same properties, right? So the clusters in some sense, we want them to be pure, right? So it's all, you know, blue, all, all, all green. Um, and then, you know, if you want to, like, like you're saying, you're saying, okay, look, I want, you know, 30% of millennials and, you know, 70% of, you know, whatever else I called like generation Z, right? And, uh, um, you know, this cluster is very typical for that. And that very cluster, cluster is very typical for that. Yeah. Then you just sample from them. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, all right, then we're done for today. Um, we actually, we're gonna have, uh, gosh, we're gonna have two more lectures and we have one more uh, seminar. Um, we'll have a lecture um, on uh, uh, recommender systems next week. And then we'll have a closing lecture, you know, overall on, on sort of data science and business. And uh, we'll have a um, seminar today and a seminar next week and uh, there is no final exam. So the, the grade is computed from your homework grades. Okay, all right. Well, then we're done today. Thank you very much and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.